we value living in a world where people care for one another. How on earth did I get here? How am I here? If parents are struggling to prioritize their own well-being, how can we better support them? They saw in me the present and the future. What can we do? I was now married and I was now a mom. She's an incredibly powerful voice for gender equality and advocate for social justice. What is good rhetoric? How do you write and perform a speech that's engaging and feels relevant? Good rhetoric can be defined in its own right and in comparison to bad rhetoric. So in this video, I'll analyze a speech by Catherine and a speech by Megan separately and draw comparisons along the way and at the end. The speeches are performed in different settings, Catherine's in a homey environment, in front of a camera, and Megan's in front of a live audience. However, they're both speeches, both are scripted, and both are about causes they advocate for. What do you think about the speeches? Let us know in the comments. Let's go for it. First of all, a few words about rhetoric and speeches. Catherine and Megan's speeches are comparable in that they're both aimed at convincing, convincing people about the sincerity of their causes and the relevance of their work. One of the best ways to convince is to address and associate with as wide an audience as possible. If you, as a speaker, can appeal to shared values, you create the opportunity for identification, that audiences identify themselves with you, and hence your causes. In order for identification to happen, people need to recognize themselves in your speech, recognize themselves in the values you present and thus represent. When identification happens, the audience has become an ally, and that's how you know your speech has been successful. All of this doesn't mean that what speakers say is automatically fake or contrived, not at all. Many speakers are very sincere about their beliefs and causes, even if they're reading from a teleprompter. What it means is that as a speaker, you only have a limited amount of time, and in that time, you want to be as effective as possible. Rhetoric helps you achieve that goal. How effective are Catherine and Megan? Let's start with Catherine. The pandemic has been a worrying time for us all. We've experienced isolation, loss and uncertainty. But in the midst of this crisis, we've also seen huge acts of kindness, generosity and empathy. If you notice it, most speeches start by acknowledging something negative, whatever it may be. The reason for this is that the positive elements of the speech will then have more weight, like light on a cloudy day seems extra bright and seem that more powerful. With the conjunction but which minimizes the negative, she emphasizes and thus wants the audience to focus on the positive. In general, people dislike speeches that are solely negative, as they sound like complaining, and no one likes complaining. Instead, emphasizing the positive while still acknowledging the negative will feel encouraging to most audiences. Everyone likes to feel encouraged, except for this guy. Oh, hi, Mark. This is a moment of uncertainty like none of us have ever seen in our lifetimes. And in this moment, as Canadians, as liberals, we must remember who we are. The world is changing fast, but our top priority will always remain building a better today and tomorrow for you and for your kids. We must remember who we are. The way the Canadian Prime Minister performs his statements here can come across as hyperbolic and overdone in terms of his effective prosody, his very obvious changes in pitch, loudness and rate in order to convey emotion. In comparison, Catherine has a way of delivering the negative and the positive for that matter that feels like a conversation you would have with one of your friends. She performs a speech without performing it, so to speak. This speaks to personality. Not everyone's delivery comes across as authentic and organic. In my company, I'm constantly reminded of how important it is to encourage my employees, no matter how much conflict they cause. Excuse me. I mean, excuse me, sir. Yes? It's just that this chair doesn't work so good anymore. And we don't have any other chairs since you told me to cut our expenses by 90%. Well, are you sitting down? Yes, sir. 
then it's not the chair that's the problem. It's just, I can't reach the table, sir. Look, when I hired you 12 years ago, what was the one thing I told you I expected from all my employees? Staying positive. And why? Because you're a positive person. And? Because this company is all about positivity. Exactly. So tell me, are you still working for this company? Yes, sir. So, what do you say we actually get some work done, in a positive fashion? Next, rather than simply acknowledging the negative, Catherine shows an ability to find something useful in the negative. The pandemic has reminded us just how much we value living in a world where people care for one another and the importance of feeling connected to the people around us. Because these lessons seem obvious and uncontroversial, they have an encouraging function. I say uncontroversial because trying to find something positive and something negative isn't always the best strategy. Sometimes it makes the speaker look insensitive. We went to Rwanda, which was incredible because Rwanda has um, the highest um, percentage of female political participants of any other country in the world. In the wake of, obviously, such a horrendous experience that they had, Yes, A, so many of the men were lost in the genocide, so it gave women an opportunity to either succumb to that or to then find some strength and then mobilize in a way that was really empowering. And I think that's specifically what they've done, which is a great benchmark for what women all over the world could be doing. Megan's so fixated on the buzzword empowerment that she doesn't see that it's misplaced in this context. Sometimes the circumstances are too tragic to find anything positive about them. It all comes down to the topic at hand, not to mention the self-awareness of the speaker. And it's these connections these relationships that are founded in the earliest years of our lives. This is what contextualization is used for. By contextualizing her cause, the early years, she rhetorically makes it seem that more relevant to everyone, since everyone in the world experienced what the time she's talking about was like. She's now created the necessary bridge, which allows her to elaborate on her cause and address as wide an audience as possible. Part of this elaboration means dealing with an objection she's faced. We should notice the way she deals with it. Let's watch. People often ask why I care so passionately about the early years. Many mistakenly believe that my interest stems from having children of my own. And while of course I care hugely about their start in life, this ultimately sells the issue short. Parenthood isn't a prerequisite for understanding the importance of the early years. If we only expect people to take an interest in the early years when they have children, we are not only too late for them, we are underestimating the huge role others can play in shaping our most formative years too. She went from the personal pronoun I, her own personal situation, to we and our, speaking on behalf of a collective. And which collective? The collective she's rhetorically constituted by literally addressing everyone. That's what the contextualization was for. This way, she's once again managed to turn a negative, a potential negative, the objection, into a positive. The role everyone plays in shaping lives, regardless of their status. Rhetorically, this is a good way to break down barriers, while still remaining assertive and unequivocal in denying the objection. Some people don't respond well to objections. And, and if you keep probing, we're going to stop the interview. I, if I, I probe about what the truth is? You keep invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. Why don't you tell me what your truth is, and you're walking on 30 seconds more of the nights before I get up. Finally, Catherine avoids the conjunction but. She doesn't say, I care about my children, but. Instead, she uses while to initiate a subordinate clause, which still emphasizes the natural concern she has for her children. And while of course I care hugely about their start in life, Catherine continues the association in order to break down barriers, which is particularly important for royals to do, as there is an outer barrier. But there doesn't have to be a barrier in terms of what we all want and value as human beings, which is the point she's making. Over the last decade, I, like many of you, have met people from all walks of life. I've seen that experiences such as homelessness, addiction and poor mental health are often grounded in a difficult childhood. This was the acknowledging of the negative, so next we predictably get the emphasis of the positive. 
But before we do, it's worth noting that what she says is common sense. When someone has these problems, it'll at the very least seem conceivable to people that they stem from childhood. She could have used more controversial and specific adjectives than difficult, but she doesn't, and she also inserts the adverb often so as to not suggest that this is a causal connection, that because you've had a problematic childhood, you'll necessarily have problems as an adult. Are often grounded in a difficult childhood. In other words, Catherine's rhetoric isn't divisive or judgmental. A sensitive topic such as this could create a divide if the speaker's careless with their word choice. The inclusion or exclusion of a single word can cause huge conflict. The, the original cartoon came out in 1937, yeah. and very evidently so, <laughs> um, with a guy who literally stalks her. <laughs> yeah. Weird, 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 weird. Now it's time for the encouragement, once again initiated by the contrasting conjunction but. But I have also seen how positive protective factors in the early years can play a critical role in shaping our futures too. And I care hugely about this. Rather than an overly emotional delivery, which very well could have been the outcome with another speaker speaking about this topic, Catherine's line of reasoning has been an appeal to Logos, logic and reason, that because of all the reasons she's mentioned, she cares about the early years. The effect of the Logos appeal is that when she draws attention to herself, and I care hugely about this, it's less likely that people will consider it to be self-centered and self-promotional. It's more likely that they'll consider it to be promotion of the cause rather than promotion of the speaker, which is very different. Next, she refers to science, continuing the Logos-based grounds to her claim that the early years are important. Referring to science is also an ethos appeal, competence and credibility, showing that she's done her research. Because the science shows that the early years are more pivotal for future health and happiness than any other period in our lifetime. Because as many as 40% of our children will arrive at school with below the expected levels of development. And because the social cost of late intervention has been estimated to be over £17 billion a year. With this, Catherine makes it clear that it's not just her opinion and assumption, she gives actual percentages. In other words, she continues the Logos appeal rather than the pathos appeal, emotion and pity, that's often overwhelmingly present in speeches like this. It's present, but not overwhelmingly, which is the point. To many people, especially people who are skeptical of a speaker's statements and intentions, Logos is more convincing than pathos. To many people, pathos, or too much pathos, will seem contrived and exaggerated. Of course, the presupposition in Catherine's argumentation is that interventions work. However, in any five-minute speech, there will for certain be uncontested presuppositions. It's worth noting that when mentioning these negative numbers, she still uses the associating pronoun our. Because as many as 40% of our children so rhetorically, she's with the parents of these children. She's not against them, and her rhetoric doesn't alienate them. This point is further evidenced in the following. The early years are therefore not simply just about how we raise our children. They are, in fact, about how we raise the next generation of adults. They are about the society we will become. Which is why I wanted to start a society-wide conversation to hear what people across the UK think about the early years too. The Logos appeal is identified by the little words Catherine uses. The adverb, therefore, creates a bridge between the statistics and what she thinks as a result of these statistics. The early years are therefore not simply just about how we raise our children. Rhetorically, this makes her arguments easy to follow, easy to understand in terms of claims and grounds, even to people who might disagree. She doesn't highlight her own opinions and feelings first and foremost. Instead, she presents evidence of why she thinks the way she does, which comes across as a more mature and proper way of arguing. In contrast, too much pathos ruins the impression of a speech, a sermon. And the United States of America is healed you, and well Thank you, again, saith the mighty Hallelujah. Spirit Glory. Glory. of peace. Glory. Spirit. Two times, Catherine says, They are, they are. This is an episusis, repetitions to increase the impact of a speaker's words and make the words more memorable. 
Every rhetorical trope or figure can be overdone and come across as forced, and Epizeusus is no exception. People might think that you actually haven't bent this curve at all, because if you had bent the curve, then we wouldn't be where we are, and that actually you don't have the track record. Yeah, it's easy to say, oh, housing is terrible right now, and it is. Would it have been worse if we hadn't lifted a, a million people out of poverty? Would it have been worse if we hadn't created a million jobs? Would it be worse? Would it be worse if we weren't building uh, reconciliation with indigenous people to create economic prosperity there? Would it be worse if we weren't drawing in investments like, would it have been worse? Would it have been worse? Would it be worse? Would it be worse? Would it be worse? This is what happens when image protection is more important to a leader than engaging in a conversation. And many people detect this tactic immediately. In this final clip, Catherine continues to make her speech relevant by posing thoughtful questions. Firstly, if parents are struggling to prioritize their own well-being, how can we better support them? Secondly, what is at the root of why parents feel so judged? Thirdly, how can we address parental loneliness? And finally, if less than a quarter of us understand the unique importance of a child's first five years, what can we do to make this better known? Rhetoric is about what is being said. Rhetorical analysis, on the other hand, is about what's not being said. In that regard, verbs like support and solve sound a lot better than saying money. The money that would go into supporting families and solving parental loneliness. Not everyone would be on board with a speaker talking about money, least of all specific amounts of money. Rhetoric matters, and this is why. How can we better support them? Similarly, the judge part is sure to have wide appeal. What is at the root of why parents feel so judged? It's a word that appeals to feelings that many parents and people in general can identify themselves with. However, some people might find it to be a somewhat vague and unsolvable problem, as it's dependent on how each person feels about themselves. Overall, Catherine's speech is designed to engage and feel relevant to everyone. She gives her personal opinions based on research and a long line of interrelated thoughts. This doesn't mean that the speech doesn't contain any debatable points. Like in all speeches, there are debatable points. Using Logos-based argumentation doesn't necessitate that the speaker is correct in all counts. But the point is that her argumentation is overt as opposed to covert, even to people who might disagree. In terms of demeanor, she's calm and rational as opposed to dramatic and emotional. This makes her relatable. From a rhetorical standpoint, this speech is very engaging and thus has the potential to be very convincing, with plenty of room for people to identify themselves with Catherine, and as a result, her causes. Let's compare what we've seen and heard to Meghan's speech at the One Young World Summit in Manchester. Meghan's a so-called counselor at One Young World, which is about empowering and developing young leaders to build a fair, sustainable future for all. Fun fact, Justin Trudeau is also one of the councillors. She's an incredibly powerful voice for gender equality, and she continues to speak out and advocate for women's issues and social justice. Her new podcast, Archetypes, just topped the Spotify charts around the world. And <laughs> Please give a very warm One Young World welcome to the co-founder of Archwell, Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. It is very nice to be back in the UK. As you'll likely hear many times this week, look, as we just heard, you'll hear all sorts of things. Some very heavy, some very uplifting, but the resounding spirit I believe you'll hear is that you are the future. But I would like to add to that, that you are also the present. Right off the bat, we notice that Megan speaking directly to the organization. There's no contextualization, which would have made what she's about to say relevant to a wide audience. And even in her message to the organization, she doesn't specify her claims. Thus, it's not made clear what she means by adjectives like heavy and uplifting. And it's not clear what she means by being the future. Such a phrase can mean many things to many different people. Also, her addition that they're not just the future, but also the present. But I would like to add to that. Isn't much of an addition at all, as it's usually the case that people that are part of the future are also observable in the present. You are the ones driving the positive and necessary change needed across the globe now in this very moment. And for that, 
I'm so grateful to be in your company today. Which changes? Which positive changes? Unlike the beginning of Catherine's speech, there's no clarification, no logos-based argumentation. Instead, we get a lot of nice-sounding words, devoid of context. But that's not all we get, because Megan has a lot of things she wants us to know about herself. It was several years ago, in 2014, that I was first invited to be a counselor at One Young World. Young, ambitious, advocating for the things I deeply and profoundly believed in. And what were the things she deeply and profoundly believed in? She doesn't tell us, and there's a reason why she doesn't tell us. Because this speech is about image first and foremost, trying to guide people's perception of her. By implication, speeches are always also about image. But in Megan's case, it's not an addition. Her life story, and thus image, is at the forefront. There's no argumentation, no specific mentions of the work that she's supposedly doing, or the work that this, I'm sure, meaningful and totally necessary organization does. So, unlike Catherine's speech, there's no line of reasoning that's easy for people to follow and relate to. Megan's focus on image is also emphasized by the overly convincing linguistic elements, deeply and profoundly. Advocating for the things I deeply and profoundly believed in. Rather than actually talking about the issues she advocates for, it's more important for her to make sure that people get the desired impression of her, apparently. Her rhetoric reveals as much, and things are about to get even better. And also looking around and wondering, how on earth did I get here? <laughs> Have any of you today so far had that feeling, that pinch me moment where you just go, how am I here? Oh, it's a lot. By how first minimizing her presence and then sounding exhausted, she actually emphasizes her presence and success. This point becomes clearer here. And, and at that dinner, there were about 20 to 30 of us for the counselors. And there I was, I was the girl from Suits. <laughs> and I was surrounded by world leaders, humanitarians, prime ministers, and activists that I had such a deep and long-standing respect and admiration for. This is classic humblebrag. Humblebrag is when certain types of people use a seemingly self-deprecating statement that's actually meant to draw attention to their impressive qualities or achievements. Here, the self-deprecating statement is about a role in suits. And there I was. I was the girl from suits which is then used to emphasize the impressive achievement of being surrounded by people like Justin Trudeau. Would it have been worse? Would it have been worse? Would it be worse? Also, Megan doesn't exactly have a history of minimizing her role in suits. I love women who I am able to look up to and say, they have done so much in terms of leadership, but also promoting diversity. And what mm -hmm. she's, like USA Network especially, mm -hmm. I feel really proud of, really embraced changing the landscape of television in that way. Um, suits is not, what I ever thought my, I never thought my life would be that awesome. I never thought that I'd have a show that went for this long. That's crazy. Knowing this, her seemingly self-deprecating statement in the speech doesn't sound entirely heartfelt, to say the least. And there I was. I was the girl from Suits. Once again, she's focused on adjectives like deep and long-standing in order to guide people's impression of her. There's no talk about why she has a deep, profound and long-standing respect for these people which makes the words sound like overcompensation, that she knows she doesn't have anything specific to say about her work or this organization. And I was invited to pull up a seat at the table. Just in case the audience had any doubt that when you're invited to something, you're also allowed to sit down. At the table, she says, indicating that this is the kind of table where you get to decide. We still haven't heard what you get to decide, but it doesn't look like we're supposed to either, because this is about branding, not argumentation, not actually advocating for a cause or making an engaging speech. Megan continues sharing her experiences in the same way that neighbors might force you to watch all of their photos from their latest vacation, and you don't know how to get out of the situation. This time, her descriptions come with a cute anecdote, which sounds about as authentic as the organization's mission statement. I was so overwhelmed by this experience. I think, I think I even saved my little paper place card that said my name on it. Um... In itself, there's nothing wrong with an anecdote. If it's done right, it can be a good and even cute addition. 
However, it should be the icing on the cake. It shouldn't be the actual cake. And that's the point. Because Megan hasn't contextualized. Because she hasn't said anything substantial and factual. She, as a speaker, isn't relatable enough yet to make this deliberate attempt to appear relatable. As a result, then, it's just another detail that no one asked for. Just proof. Proof that I was there. And proof that I belonged. Ironically, this clip is proof that humblebrag always leads to more self-praise. Will we ever learn about this organization's work? I sure can't wait to find out. Because the truth was, I wasn't sure that I belonged. I was so nervous. Oh, I doubted myself and I wondered. Nope, not here. Let's fast forward a little bit. But one young world saw in me what I wanted to see fully in myself, they saw in me, just as I see in you, the present and the future. The perspective Megan has here speaks volumes about what we've already observed, that this is self-promotion. It's about her qualities, what they saw in her, not what she saw in them, aside from the chance to get a seat at the table. However, because the speech is so unapologetically self-focused, it's likely to have the opposite outcome of what's intended, that people are actually not as overwhelmed by Megan's achievements as she wants them to be, to put it very mildly. It's also worth noting that the members of the organization are literally mentioned as a side note. They saw in me, just as I see in you. Syntactically then, the focus is on Megan being the present and future, whatever that means. Let me know if you know. You know. Megan isn't done addressing the members as a literal side note, a sidebar. And just as a sidebar, earlier this afternoon we sat down with a few of you delegates. And it was incredibly inspiring, the resounding themes that came up about representation, about inclusion, and about trying to shift the global perspective for all of us as a global community to one of curiosity over criticism. This excerpt shows that to Megan it's about using the right words because they're devoid of actual and specific content. Thus, she doesn't substantiate her alleged inspiring experience, and as a result, the audience can't relate to what was so inspiring about it. Megan makes no attempt to present cohesive experiences and arguments, or arguments at all. And just as important, she makes no attempt to create an engaging and relevant experience for the audience, both off and online. Watch this. I joined you in London in 2019, and by that point, it's fair to say, my life had changed rather significantly. I was now married, and I was now a mom. Without context, without substance, personal details come across as not only irrelevant to the hearers on a personal level, but also to the summit. The next clip demonstrates this lack of self-awareness. We often hear people say the time is now, but I'm going to double down on that. Sounds brave. I can't wait to hear what the message is. Something deep and profound, I hope. I'm going to double down on that by saying your time is now. The important work can't wait for tomorrow. And this week the world is watching as you cement your place in history by showcasing the good that you are doing today in the present moment as we embrace the moment of now to create a better tomorrow. This flies in the face of everything we know about good and effective rhetoric, being clear and to the point. Instead, Megan uses deeply and profoundly contrived platitudes with a meaning that's not only difficult to see, but is most likely non-existent. When I say there's a lack of self-awareness, I should qualify it. On the one hand, Megan's very self-aware, aware of what she says and how she says it. On the other hand, and this is more important to know as a speaker, she lacks awareness of what other people will think about her words. You can use all the buzzwords and platitudes in the world, but they're not a substitute for meaning, depth and relevance. We've now seen two completely different speeches, one that's rhetorically engaging and one that's a fragmented collection of experiences with a thinly veiled self-aggrandizing purpose, one that's riveting and one that's alienating. Rhetoric matters, but personality matters as well. It's hard to imagine Catherine delivering the type of speech that Megan does, and vice versa. 
In general, most of what people say speaks to personality. In that sense, people aren't alike, and in that sense, we can't always trust that other people have the same intentions as we do. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go to the gym, which will be an inclusive and empowering experience. Do you have any deep and profound experiences planned for today? See you next time.